Chaim. We're going to begin. So we have till quarter past seven. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We're going to be speaking about the ego, the nafs, and uh, something about how it relates to our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to this journey. We're going to understand something, there's a map to do with the ego. So we said that all of these things, they unpack deeper and further. And we're going to acquaint ourselves with something of maybe even our own egos. And what we're going to do after this class, inshallah, we're going to get, be getting into some of the ways to examine the ego, the nafs, and how to treat it, and how to train it. And we're going to be going through it uh, step by step, inshallah. So inshallah, hope you're ready for the ride. Why do we have a nafs? Why do we have egos? Has anyone ever contemplated that? People talk about the really big stuff. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of my existence? What's the, why do you have an ego? Wouldn't it be a whole lot easier if the Matrix had no Mr. Anderson? Huh? Survival. survival. How do you mean survival? MashaAllah. You, you're, you're completely in the right direction, by the way. I'm not being, you know. Yeah, to fight for uh, your living area. Okay. Space okay. So, were you not to have the inclination, which is related to the ego, for food, then you'd die. Because it might just be easier. If there was no taste, if there was no, you know, it was just porridge, maybe some people would like it. I don't know. It's like, you know, if, it was just, if, it, if there was no desire, then you just, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to sustain yourself. Okay. So it's got something to do with the maintenance of the necessities of living. Yeah. It's all from Allah, as we know. It's all from Allah. Allah is the one that sustains. But He's made in His, in this great system, asbab, means. And it's part of having adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we mean by adab? You know, it's not trust in Allah to say, I'm not going to eat and Allah will sustain me. No, Allah is, kulu wa shrabu, hani and mari, and I'll eat and drink. You know. Eat and drink of the good things that we provided for you. you know? and, and then we have within the sacred law, there are certain uh, boundaries to that which you can eat and that we can drink, which is vast. The halal is far uh, more expansive than that which has been made prohibited for us, which has been made prohibited for a reason and infinite wisdom, some of which we're in tune to, some of which we're not, we're not made privy to. So it's to, that's to do with eating. Shahwat al akil, shahwat al ta'am. In terms of lust, were there to be no existence to that particular desire for copulation, then the human species would not continue. You know, because with marriage, there can be inherent responsibilities. There has to be a giving up of certain freedoms, maybe. You know, and this is why typically it's, it's, it was always within Muslim societies, it was recommended that people were married young and didn't wait for so long. And it's much harder typically for people to kind of, you know, um, bind together if they're at a certain age because they've already been like solidified, they've already been formed and they've got their own ideas and like, that's not the way to cook the eggs, you know, nothing. You know, I don't like my, you know, butter spread that way. I like it, you know, on both sides. God, I've been doing this for 20 years and she still doesn't got a clue. You know, you have all these kind of small things, but they become big things. You know, potentially. And sometimes it works. But we're talking about general tr trends. If someone's young, kind of clueless, doesn't really have any expectations, you know, it's easier. And that's one of the reasons out of many why 
maybe one generation ago, definitely two generations ago, divorce was almost unheard, unheard of. One of the reasons out of many. SubhanAllah. So that's part of the, the wisdom behind the presence of that component of the nafs. And same in terms of clothing. It's, it's, it's an obligation. If someone had no, you know, there are all of these kind of things, but what's he got to do with? Balance. And the balance is necessity or, and what we mean by literally to exist, to, to, to survive, or that which you can seek the pleasure of Allah with. So you're not going to die if you don't, I don't know, like, think of something. I mean. If you never taste thirid, thirid is broth with barley bread, and it was the, f the favorite food of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They make it in Yemen. You're not going to die because you've never done that. But, you know, if you made an intention for, for sunnah and to follow the Prophet, وسلم, there's a reward in it. You know. But in essence, what we're understanding here is Allah created this component within every single one of us to, you know, and part of the wisdom, not the entirety of the wisdom, but part of the wisdom is for. Uh, for, our, for us to be sustained and for us to, to exist. Now what starts to happen is you have this little thing called Hawa. And we've spoken about this in previous sessions. Hawa is that, that impulse or maybe that, that, that... I like the idea of translating it. It's like hot air. It's that fuel. It's almost like that kind of spiritual adrenaline rush. Sometimes there's, there's an actual adrenaline rush to the heart where you feel your heart pumping. But it's, this is more subtle, but it influences the nafs. It's the fuel for the nafs that moves it into things. And it can be stirred up by looking at something or smelling something. What's on, what's on the stove in that place? Mashallah. <clears throat> it's always a bit of a fitna walking through the streets of... Uh, some of the northern towns of England, where they're like, uh, mashallah, concentrated communities of people typically from the uh, subcontinent. So, you know, on the cold air, you get these beautiful smells of like curry and like, mm, mashallah, like, you know, English is, uh, in England, the, the, the national dish is curry. <laughs> you know this? It's like the most popular dish in the UK. No, fish and chips is as well. It's uh, so last summer. No one's into the fish and chips. I mean, you have it. But even there, they, you know, it's, it's run by Muslims a lot of the time. You can get a curry on the side. But that kind of thing, maybe you weren't even hungry. You weren't like, you know, just where could I eat? I've not eat. Maybe you just had a meal, but it's something that smells nice. It excites the nafs. Now, that's the smell, which is a f one of the hawas. It's one of the senses, the physical senses. But it has an impact on something spiritual within you, which is this hawa. Now the hawa moves into the nafs and kind of like gets the nafs starting. You know, we should really go out for a curry tonight. We should really go. And it starts to do this kind of thing. So if you're aware of these entry points, like what's actually taking place with me now? Why did I get the vibe to go and to do this? It becomes very, like, it becomes very useful in your, in your spiritual wayfaring can understand why, you, why you're doing what you're doing. One of the definitions of hawa, kullu mail ila al-batil. What it means is it's every form, every type of inclination, movement towards that which is not real, that which is inauthentic, that which is fake, and by implication, that which is not healthy for you, that is not, not that which is not good for you, that which is not sustain you. It's batil, and batil, as we know, is the opposite of haq. So, in that inclination, you know, through this fuel, it's like you put the fuel in the car, and it you know it makes you go off on a tangent. You know. By implication, you're veering away from haq, from what's real. 
And the more a person becomes accustomed to this hawa and letting it flow throughout them, the more you become unable to recognize what's real. That kind of nafs, that kind of um, state of ego, is a characteristic component of the first degree of ego. We talked about the degrees or the stations of yaqeen, of certainty. Now we're going to go in. Okay, what are, one, what are, these, what's this, what are the things which are pre- prohibiting us now from going up that mountain? Why am I feeling a bit laden down, a bit heavy? And one of them is the nafs. One of the, one of the things which does this is the nafs. It's not the only thing. One of these awarad, Imam al-Ghazali goes into this in his book, Minhaj al-Abideen. We can go through some of these things in forthcoming lessons. But I thought it was appropriate to start with a nafs, because typically that's the thing that we're all trying to deal with. You see, how, to, how do you get to Allah? Leave yourself aside and come. You know. Allah is not veiled. Jalla Jalalu. Allah is, Allah is not veiled. Allah is not veiled. We are the ones that are veiled. And one of the biggest forms of veil, veiling is the nafs, is the ego. Because that has an effect on the heart. If you veer towards that which is batil, it moves you away from experiencing something of the Divine Presence. From tasting something in your prayer, from having a soft heart. Because what happens with the nafs is this, in these, these inner dynamics which we've been exploring over the previous weeks, is it spills out into the heart. And that's why the root, but the root of it is the nafs. Because the place of the heart and the soul is its ulwi, is its, is its uh, heavenly, it, its normal state of place. It's like a bird, you know, it just flies in the heavens. This is one of the, one of the explanations of the meaning in Surah Al-Mulk. ما يمسكهن إلا الرحمن It talks about the birds flying in this. Non, literally, yumsik, non holds it, except the most merciful. And what we're talking about here is when you see birds in the sky, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which causes them to, to fly. We can understand you know, scientifically how the, you know, their wings, you know, that's not what we're talking about. If Allah didn't want them to fly, they wouldn't fly. But they say one of the meanings of this is it's the, 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 the tayr, the bird here, is also representative of the soul. Nobody holds the soul. Except Ar Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most compassionate. So the, the, the default domain and abode of the soul is in the divine presence. The nafs, however, is this place of qadorat, it's dirty, it's, it's egotistic. This is, that's the default state. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by this and points to the nafs in the Quran, not the heart in this, raqa, in this regard. قَدَ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدَ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَاهَا Indeed, he or she has أَفْلَحَ has succeeded. مَنْ زَكَّاهَا The one that has gone through this form of تَزْكِيَةَ is where we get these words from. It's all directly from the Qur'an. And تَزْكِيَةَ or زَكَّاهَ is from زَكَا which means purity or cleanliness. Like the zakat of your wealth is to give off that which is, is not beneficial <coughs> for you in your health. He succeeded the one that has purified it. What's this it, the nafs? That's what's being zakaha, the nafs. And he is ruined, the one that has neglected it. He's become in a ruinous state, perished. The one that has neglected it. What's the it that's referred to here? وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا In the previous. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Tamam. So the nafs, if it's purified, it has a reciprocal effect into the heart. And that's why they say, 
has a pure heart, has a pure tamam. So the nafs, the first degree of nafs is called the nafs al-ammara. Sometimes, and this is a, it's abbreviated um, uh, term from nafs al-ammara bisu. Literally, the ego of which its default state is that it constantly commands and pulls back, tells you to do that which is wrong. Okay. And typically this is when people talk about the ego, this is what they're talking about, it's that negative ego. When they say, you've got such a wonderful ego, if you, in English, you, you're such an egotistical person. That's not a compliment. If there are a higher degree of the ego, it may, it may very well be. And nafs is zaki. It's one of the names that they, that they extol, you know, they, they, they uh, call the Prophet the possessor, the possessor of the most refined and pure nafs. You know. So that's a very different kind of ego here. Now, amara in the Arabic language is what's called sirat and mubalagha. Amara, by, by uh, technically in the language, the more words you in, letters you increase and compact into that word, the more emphatic it becomes. And it comes from Amara. Amara. So you've added a shadda in there, you've added, uh, added an alif med in there. Amara is this nafs which is like constantly nagging, constantly having a go, constantly telling you to do it. And it overpowers you. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٍ Indeed, the nafs inclines towards the suit. Now, if a person goes through a, to a, through a state, uh, a process of training, what starts to take place is the first marhala or the first phase of um, refinement starts to take place. Okay? And a person moves up in their degrees of, of, uh, of refinement to something which is called a nafsa lawama. Lawama. From the root word loam. Loam means blame. To blame or to reproach, to take someone into account. Some uh, people have translated this as the cognitive faculty in the human being, which allows you to now differentiate and see the difference between right and wrong. Because the nafs al lamara, who cares? I've got no accountability. I'll do what I want. I'm here to enjoy life. How much of this is so essential to our way of being? If you look at, once again, in, in psychology, it's the study of the psyche. The psyche means, it can mean from Greek, it can mean a soul, it can mean a breath. But what we're talking about here is the mind. Now, if you're reducing all of these inner things, all of these various components, which the Prophet ﷺ taught us about, to just something in the mind, then it, you're going to mistreat it. You're going to give it the wrong training. You're not going to recognize it. You're going to think, you know, my mind isn't feeling right, very good right now. It's not your mind. And you're not feeling. It's a misarticulation of, a, of what you experience. And therefore, you're imposing a different reality. Onto what, it's a misdiagnosis. It's catastrophic. So the nafs al-lawama now starts to... What the, what's that like? Okay, you did something. And this is why knowledge of the sharia of the sacred law, is so important in saluk. It's not like, yeah, they're, they're just doing their thing and we'll do, alhamdulillah, we'll do the whole, you know, spiritual thing. No, there is no difference between the two. You know, one cradles the other, you know. The nafs al you start to recognize, wait a minute, what I just did there was wrong. And you start to reproach yourself. Astaghfirullah. 
could I have done such a thing? I need to try to be a better person next time. So now you're, a, you're starting to be aware, and that's a form of consciousness. That's a sign that you're now becoming more aware of yourself. Previous, maybe, like you wouldn't have even recognized, oh, what? What's the big deal? What did I do? Did nothing wrong. And maybe you'll even defend what you did wrong if somebody reproaches you about it. So one of the signs of the Nasr al-Amara is it's, it does not like blame. Who are you to say that to me? I'm not like, you're like that. Look at you. Who do you think you are? Huh? Has it got anything to do? If somebody says, for example, Imam Ghazali, this is one of the signs of a person who's sincere. If a young child says a truth to you, you know, whatever it may be, you know what, you're f- so full of yourself. Yeah. And they're like, I've, that's from a six-year-old, that cut deep. How are you going to do it? Children nowadays have no manners. Like, where did you, what madrasa did you go to? Like, these Muslim kids these days, like, back in the day, they never would have done, in time of Imam Ghazali, you know, he never would have done such. And you're going like, but is it true? Imam Ghazali is saying, like, if it's true, you've got to take it on board. It doesn't matter who it's from. A person who is objective, that's the nature. The lawama starts, you now become an objective. Habib Umar, he says, I'm on the side of anyone that's, that's with me against my own nafs. I'm on their side. Now that's a wali. That's a person of God. Because you're so objective. You know, and what kind of nafs is there anyway? But like, that's a, so where are we at? It's a, it's a world view. You know, if someone points out something to you, uh, you take it on board. So nafs al lawama. And this is, once again, this is balanced. Because even in the lawama, it's not necessarily a state where you're constantly um, in harmony, you're at peace. It can actually be quite an uncomfortable state. This is sometimes what happens if people start to get into spending time in good company. As we said in the, in the session on the ba'ith, this is one of the things that a person should actively be doing in their approach to Allah, to actively seek out good company and to actively draw away from bad company. But what starts to happen is like things show up. Someone once explained it like, it's like if you take like a flannel, like a cloth, small cloth, or tea towel, whatever it is. And you know, you go through the motion, but you're washing it in dirty water. You're like, I'm doing, I'm doing everything. It's all good. I'm doing my dick and I'm doing my that and you know, my this and my that. And you go through the motions and you can't really see anything different. The moment you move into a, a purer space with more refined company, then your brothers as a mirror unto you will reflect things. You know? And it's like placing this dirty like cloth in pure water, and you're not even wringing it out now. You're not trying to wash it, and all of a sudden these like plumes of like dirt, and you're like, what's going on? This isn't me, it's you. See, these guys, they're all fakers anyway. They're all like religious guys, not my thing. I like my own, yeah, I'm on my own way. SubhanAllah. It's a nafs al lawama. You gotta get it back in check, and you gotta, Feel the pinch, feel the pain. You've got to be prepared for some kind of discomfort. Because you're never going to achieve anything except through discipline. And there has to be an element of discipline. But with that, the scholars they say it's like training a horse, breaking a horse in. At the beginning, you might be, get thrown off, and it might take ten times. But why does the horse trainer persist? Why do they carry on? It's not like, oh, forget this. Because they know the horse has that qabiliya. It has that receptivity. It has the potential to become cultivated. And that's why you should never give up. Because somebody that gives up, it's like saying, that, no, Allah has created the nafs to have the potential to become refined. And have hope in Allah. Ask Allah, Allah, help me. Help me in my own self. Against my own self to be a better self. You've got to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the nafs al-lawama. 
فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Then you have, if a person maintains that state and Allah gives them grace, tawfiq, he, they become more and more refined. And they move into another category or another phase or dimension of the nafs, which is called nafs al-mulhama. So we have, وَلَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَارَةٌ بِالسُّوءُ نَفْسَ اللَّوَّامَةٌ وَلَا أُقِسِمُ بِالنَّفْسِ اللَّوَّامَةٌ Then you have the nafs al-mulhama فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا All derived from the Qur'an. Six of the seven are derived from the Qur'an. The seventh <coughs> is derived from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the mulhama is where you receive ilham. The nafs starts to receive or becomes a reciprocal, it becomes a, like a satellite dish of the soul, it becomes able to receive more sensitive things going on. And Allah will inspire it through this. And you become more inclined now towards good. It's kind of now moving the balance from what was the first stage called? What was the first degree of the nafs? The nafs al-ammara. Then you go to the lawama. Then the mulhama. The mulhama is now you're starting to like bring things back and the horse is starting to, okay, you're trotting a bit more and the horse is actually starting to like it. Because there are different stages. They say it's the carrot or the stick. That's also how we've got to approach the nafs, which we'll be getting into in forthcoming sessions, inshallah. So the mulhama is now you become more inspired towards doing It's easy. And your hawa starts to take on a different form. Instead of just going, you know, slipping down, you start to now tahwa, other things, yearn for other things. You, you miss the feeling when you're in a uh, gathering of sacred knowledge. You miss dhikr, you miss Mecca, you miss Medina, you miss people that inspire you to come close to Allah. That's the nafs al-mulhama at work. And then if a person maintains that state, and it's not kind of like, we've got a five, seven week program going here, get your nafs in check. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Week one, crash course in sorting your, your ego out. It doesn't work like that. That's why certain things, we, we're organisms. And this is why sacred knowledge understands that. So like, I took a course in training my nafs and I was purified by the end. I even got a certificate to show it. It's once again the worldview. The Prophet system worked on the Sahaba for 23 years. And these were a people that were prepared their hearts. They were chosen by Allah to be those people that received these realities. You know. SubhanAllah. It's amazing. You look at Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Because of the barakah, they say, the scholars say, because he was just with the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa even before the bi'atha, before prophecy, that Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had this, it was very easy. He didn't have a strong, there was no nafs there anyway. So when he became Muslim, he just ascended to the highest levels of, the, of yaqeen. And that's what we've got to understand, like with the Prophet ﷺ, people just by looking at him, this was a reality amongst the Sahaba, just by looking at him, they, they, they traversed all of the obstacles, the nests were completely gone. Just by looking at him, just because of that light, just because of that nur ﷺ. Sayyidina Mus'ab bin Umayr, radiallahu anhu, a young man in Mecca, he heard about the Prophet ﷺ, and he goes, he goes, I'm going to find out what's going on. It's still very early on in the seerah. And he goes out at night and he looks and he can find the, the Prophet وسلم, reciting the Quran. And the Prophet وسلم, although Sayyidina Mus'ab is hiding, the Prophet knows he's there. And he comes out to the Prophet وسلم, and he looks at him. The Prophet وسلم, doesn't give a, a long speech. He doesn't give him a khutbah. He doesn't say anything. He just places his hand 
on his heart, and Sayyidina Mus'ab changes 180 degrees from Kufr to Iman. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. Fudala, and he's going around the Kaaba. And the Prophet, you know, he's, he's hiding his nifaq at this time, his, his uh, absence of, of faith and his hypocrisy. And he's going around with a dagger, ready to kill the Prophet. And he's going around the Kaaba. And the Prophet periodically passes him by. And he says, Bima tu haddithu bihi nafsak ya fudala. What's going on in there, Fudala? What are you saying to yourself, Fudala? What's happening? Come on. Yalla. Bima tu haddithu bihi nafsak ya fudala. La shay ya Rasulullah. Nothing, Rasulullah. I'm just making tawaf. He goes around the other. So what would have gone through the heart of Fudala? He's going around. He's about to kill the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't say like, you know, take him now, he's hiding a dagger. And he's like, he's just like, come on, let's give you a chance here. You've got, you've got some choices. Rahma, Rahma. He knows he's about to be, he's, he has, he's trying to assassinate him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he knows where he will be, were he to have done so. Hasha. You know, come on, Fudayla. And he goes on the second time. I'm just making tawaf, ya Rasulullah. What are you doing? Bima tu haddithu bihi nafsak, ya Fudayla. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once again, like, what was going on with that hand? Like, you're connected to this. Like, you're Muslims. You're connected to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, that hand, like, what was going on in that hand? And you believe in him. That's who you are. You're Muslim. Like, you're the one that believed in him, you know. He puts his hand on his heart. And he says that before that, there was nobody I hated more than him. But when he placed his hand on my heart, I felt no, no one I, I loved, loved, loved no one more than him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He just took him literally from the pits of hell and threw him to the highest pinnacle of Jannah in one movement of the heart. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it's like at Badr, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu afterwards he was giving a khutbah, he was speaking, and he said, if anybody has, because he's talking about the rights, and this is part of the nature of the nafs, you give people their, their rights, you don't wrong people, you don't oppress people. If you get angry, that's the problem with the nafs, it just ruins like fire. <clears throat> and so much of our worldview now is like, I'll tell them the way it is. You don't put out fire with fire. What do you put out fire with? Water, a purified nafs. That's the only way. Might be hard, might take work, but that's the only way. And the Prophet was speaking to the Sahaba. <coughs> and he says, If I've taken from any of your rights, you let me know and you take it from me now. I'm telling you, I'm going to recompense you now. You tell me. And all of the Sahaba, like in tears, like. Imagine hearing that, like, Ya Rasulullah. But one of them gets up. He says, Ya Rasulullah, on the day of Badr, that you, 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 you were carrying a stick when we were all in line, and you hit me on the chest, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet, he gets down, and he says, and he tells it, he said, go and fetch the same stick that I had at Badr, and strike me on the chest. Like it was a tap, it was doing almost like, it wasn't like you, he was just moving someone into line. But he wasn't like, oh, come on, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, there was no small, if that's what you feel I've taken from your rights, then this is, this is my mu'amala with Allah. This is the way I am with Allah. So they get the stick. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Yawma Eden, on that day, I was, I, I was bare-chested. Like, this isn't the same, you're wearing clothes. And the Sahaba are like, Kaif, you know, what? And the Prophet system says, let him take his right. Pure justice, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know. And he takes 
he's, he's top of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he goes to him and he, he embraces him. He just hugs him. And the Sahaba are like, what's this? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, the way you spoke, it was like you were bidding us farewell. Like I felt the way you were speaking, it's like you were saying goodbye to us. I don't feel you're going to be with us for much longer. And I wanted my last meetings to be with you. That I have that embrace with you, Ya Rasulullah. Yeah. So the mutma'inna, tranquil nafs, ya ayyatuna nafs mutma'inna, irji'i ila, ila rabbiki radian mardiya. Oh, tranquil nafs, tranquil soul. And what that means is you become tranquil in the remembrance of Allah, tranquil in the prayer. The agitation that you feel in the prayer, I have to pray. No, you become like Rasulullah, she said, I want to pray. If I feel agitated when I'm outside of the prayer, you know, the steadiness, the ta'at, you become anything which is a form of obedience to Allah, you start to hasten towards it. And this is part of the, the realms. Now you're going to start to see the, as, you know, the, the shining lights of wilaya, of sainthood. Not that you're ordained by the head of the Muslims. I mean, Allah starts to initiate you into a deeper level of being. Allah starts to choose you to become one of his awliya. And that's the thing. That's why it's not a cult. Because the initiation is from Rabbul Alameen. It's not from like, you are now ordained and you have a badge and you have a nice ring that you can wear when you meet up and this is now you're one of the awliya. You know, that's not the way it works. There are no secret meetings or secret handshakes. The awliya, you know, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. There's no fear upon them, nor do they grieve. They're people of sifat, attributes. لا يعلم جنود ربك إلا هو. None knows the, the, the armies of Allah except Him. Not even them sometimes. There are different types of walid, you know. People say, do we believe in sainthood in Islam? Do we? Well, not in the same way that they do in Catholicism. But we believe in the potential of the human being to take on the teachings of Rasulullah and those teachings are transformative. You don't believe that? What are you doing then? You don't believe that. People, I have an issue with sainthood. And call it what you like. Wali isn't a translation of saint anyway. It's just a convenient uh, translation. A wali is man tawalla Allahu amrahu. The one that Allah takes his entire affair into his hands. You know, Allah is just watching over him and then leak care. You don't think Allah takes care of certain people? It's not a democracy. Allah chooses some people over others. When Allah, I have a particular... You know, vote against the latest motion that you chose this person. Take it up with Rabbul Alameen. It's just the way it is. And that's why in the Hadith Qudsi, Man Adani Waliyan, the one that takes enmity with a Wali of mine. Someone that, who do you think's chosen this person? Who do you think this person is? I've chosen him. Waliyan, my Wali, my friend, the one that I've chosen to purify and raise through these degrees and ascend to the highest pinnacles of the mountains of Yaqeen. You don't think I can do that and I'm Rabbil Alameen, you don't get it? And you're just some hater sitting on the sidelines? Don't, don't fail to understand Islam is real. Islam is real. You're a Muslim. You're engaged with this reality. It's not an ethnicity. Afwan. It's not an ethnicity. It's real, and it's open to you. If you have Iman in your heart, it's open to you. It's open to you. Don't sell yourself short. You know, the fact, even if the horse is all over the place, bucking all over the place, you still have a horse, and that horse is beautiful, and the potential within it, and sometimes the most stubborn horses, they make the most great stallions, and they, you know, 
beautiful, but it takes some work. May Allah give us tawfiq. So when it becomes tranquil, it starts to enter into a state where it, everything it sees coming from Allah is, it becomes radiya, it becomes content. It experiences the realities of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It sees that anything that it experiences, it's from Allah. And now it's dealt with objectively and upon principle and in accordance to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. So it's not like taza'za, it's not like, oh, why did that happen to me? Why did that happen? And that's such a beautiful state, it now becomes مَرْضِيَعًا That Allah becomes pleased with that soul And that's a, a martaba. And then it, it, its pinnacle of these seven degrees is the nafs al-kamila The complete or the whole you know, soul, the perfected soul I Don't think it ends there there are degrees to perfected souls. And the most perfected soul is the soul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So why is it hard to rec recognize the nafs? You know, because we, let's go back down for a bit. Let's not get too excited. You know, we're going through, we're going through, uh, we're going to finish at uh, 7.15, but 10 minutes. Let's go back to the nafs al-ammara, just for a minute. And the nafs, don't think the people of different, you know, higher maqams, they're just like, oh, my nafs is okay now. The nafs you, you've always got to be aware of. It's always trying to trick you. You know, you always got to be aware of it. That's part of its nature. Why is it hard to recognize? I'll give you an example. How many faults can you, are you aware of in your own self? If you had a list, 1 to 50, could you fill it up? I'd run out somewhere about 3 or 4. Yeah. Try it. They say, do this, either tonight or tomorrow. This is something, and we'll go into this, this is a, a, a precursor for a separate session. We're going to be going into muhasaba and muraqaba, introspection and retrospection. So why is it hard to do? Firstly, because it calls towards bad and like, you know, I want to enjoy life. That's where a lot of these things come from. Look through that prism. I'm living my own life, you know. Allah says, we'll, we'll revive him with a beautiful life, a real life, not the life of the nafs. When people talk, I want to enjoy life, it's, I want to enjoy my nafs. I want to give my nafs al-amara everything it desires. Now, by the essence, that you're, you're never going to be mutmain. That's not, Allah bi dhikri lahi tatma'inun qaloob. These are not the, by the remembrance of Allah, the hearts are tranquil. When that kind of person hears the dhikr of Allah, they become like, ah, I'm, I've got, I'm busy, I've got to go out, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And there's a million and one excuses. The, the nafs is the greatest attorney, it's the greatest, greatest lawyer. It's got a million and one excuses. Figure out even the hardest of cases. So why else is it hard to recognize? Because it's beloved to it, you. You love it. You love yourself. Yeah. That's why. I'll give you an example. They say, the scholars, they say, you know, that, what do you call it? Like, you know, sleepies? You know what sleepies are? I'm sure the doctor can give us a more uh, medical definition. You know, you wake up in the morning, you have those little bits in your eyes. If it's, if it's too much, they call it conjunctivitis. You know, what do you call it in Swedish? Those little bits. It's nasty. Yeah? Okay. So what do you do with it? You leave it. You wipe it away. With what? Your finger. Okay. You're going to do that to a stranger? Huh? 
Would you ever do that to a stranger? <laughs> <laughs> Don't try that. I'm not saying to try that. <laughs> Why not? Because it's nasty. So what you've got to do, why is that? Your, everyone else's dirty, horrible things are really obvious. You know, because if you get, okay, but we want 50 faults of, you know, this guy or this woman. You're going to be, okay, well, <laughs> only 50? Because you get a cup full of extra here, we can write down. Why is that? Because those things, they're more obvious. But to you, it's not an issue. It's like, you know. Hmm? They say it's like, uh, what did they say? Common sense is like deodorant. People in most need of it never use it. Why is that? Because you don't even have a, your own smell. If you smell bad, you don't get to I smell. Someone else stands next to you. It's more recognizable. So the nest, you love yourself. You say, I don't love myself. I'm, I'm really. But in reality, if you put, there, are, there are things which it's mahbuba. What's another reason? Is that it's an inward enemy. It's an inner enemy. It doesn't come from the exterior. And the analogy they give is like a thief coming to the house. May Allah protect us all. Keep our communities and our societies safe, inshallah. But if somebody comes from the outside in, you're going to notice things. Why is the door open? Why has the, the window been taken out? Why is it feeling cold in the house? Why is that not in place? Is, okay, if someone lives with you and they're thieving behind your back, but you know them, maybe you have breakfast together, but they're taking things and they know where it's placed, they know how to make it look, you're not going to notice it. And that's the nature of the nafs. It's very difficult to be objective with your own self. And that's why inherently a human being needs a method. They need a template. Habib Amr will say, but tazaki nafsak bi nafsak. You're going to sort out your own nafs, ego with your own ego. How's that going to work? And that's why you need someone else. You need somebody to guide you. You need someone to show you these things. You need someone to say, yeah, but you need to remember this. Al-mu'min mir'at al-mu'min. The believer is the mirror of his brother. She's the mirror of her sister. That's why good company is so important. Because certain things, like, why am I getting annoyed right now? Why am I getting angry right now? Why is this person irritating me? Why are they frustrating me? It's telling you about you. And were they not to be there, yeah. you'd never have the opportunity. Know your enemy, as someone once said. It was like training a horse, never give up. Now Imam al-Ghazali, he says, how do you like, where do you begin? How do you sort this out? You've got this hawa, and it comes from a place of necessity, but it's very easy, it gets out of hand. He says, you need to overpower it with a greater passion, with a greater desire, with a greater hawa. You know. So, for example, like, this is one of the wisdoms, one of the wisdoms, or in, infinitude of wisdoms, for the verses talking about Jahannam. Frightening verses. Now, one of the problems sometimes is people, you know, they are in, they've... They've grouped all these verses together which are spread out beautifully and uh, divinely in the Qur'an and they've grouped them all together and just, everything's about Jahannam and it pushes people away. You know. But the way Allah does it is to sober you up. It restrains Hawa back. If you're a person with a temper, if you're angry you know, and you hear that, it, it, it sobers the nafs. It's like, you know, it's like smelling salts they had back, you know, back in the day. It just brings you back to your state of consciousness and awareness. So it's all this sacred, you know, communication that is not just, you know, words. It's realigning your soul as you read it. You know. But they say, and we're going to end with this, <coughs> the greatest cure is love. 
Because the greatest form of hawa is love. It overpowers everything. If you, if you love someone, you're going to do anything for them. And that's what the Sahaba had with Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything except my own nafs. Sayyidina Umar, he was just he was objective. Not yet, Ya Umar. He goes back and he's objective. He deals in himself. He's amazing. Because Sayyidina Umar was very different. He was full of hawa before Islam. But that after Islam, he became one of the most, the people that he, he really showed us what can change, what can take place. Completely objective. He says, Ya Rasulullah, now you're dearer to me than everything, including my own self. al Ya Umar. Now you've got it, Umar. Now you've got it. La yu'minu ahadakum. Hatta akun ahabba ilayhi. None of you truly believe You've not really had this experience And your nafs have not really Your ego isn't there You're not tasting it You're blocking yourself You're selling yourself short Until Allah and His Prophet وسلم, Become dearer to you More beloved to you Than anything else Anything else This is what happened with the Sahaba it's related from Rumi to this meaning that your quest is not to seek love but rather to remove all the veils you've built in the way of it. And this is what we've been speaking about today. May Allah grant us tawfiq and Allah bless everyone.